Here we go. A little OT with BP. My old buddy Eric Crocker joined the show. It's War Room time. San Francisco 49ers big board for the 2024 NFL Draft right now. Yeah, rocking out. Let's get loose here. OT with BP. That's what it's all about. There's no rules. There's no structure. We can go as long as we want. We can take all night, Croc, if we need to hammer this thing out to figure out the big board for the San Francisco 49ers in the 2024 NFL Draft. And first, big welcome, Croc, to the new channel. Your first time on my new channel. I've been on the Eric Crocker channel before, which you guys got to go out there and subscribe to, along with Locked On 49ers, which I host with Eric Crocker daily here. Um, not here. We're not on the Locked On Podcast Network. We're on no <laughs> network right now. We're on our... We're in our we're around OT with BP. Croc, welcome to the program. Hey, you gotta speak it into existence. I think this is gonna be so big, this channel. I mean, you're just so great at this stuff. A network, maybe even locked on, would be like, you know what? Let's make OT with BP Peacock's own thing. And uh forget the structure that we have. We gotta let him do it. Kind of like ESPN with uh the Pat McAfee show, right? Like they, they, they let Matt McAfee. Do you be you? They're, dro- they're dropping f bombs on ESPN and all kinds of stuff. Do you be you? Maybe one day, uh, locked on, be like, all right, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's gonna be some cocktail hours here, and, and maybe tomorrow night's show. I got Larry Kruger coming on tomorrow night. I think I'm gonna have to uh mix up a little cocktail for that episode. Croc, is there a drink of choice for you when you're watching a ball game or when you're watching the NFL draft, by the way? Which is Croc is gonna be on this channel again. A week from today, going live, we're going to be going live, talking about the the NFL draft during the first round. I'm going to go on Crocs channel, day two. We're going to talk about what's going on there, round two, and uh, and having a whole bunch of fun. And, of course, doing all kinds of episodes of Locked On 49ers about all the prospects the 49ers do take in the NFL draft. Crocs, do you have a favorite cocktail? What were you drinking when we did our – the first time I met you, this was the 2018 draft. This was the Mike McGlinchey, Fred Warner draft at Yancey Saloon in San Francisco. With Dylan Simone, who's disappeared off the face of the earth, that doesn't do any 49ers stuff anymore. I, don't, I think he got me. Shout out to Dylan. A lot of people ask how I got into all of this, right? And um, shout out to my guys with nothing but Niners. You know, they kind of introduced me to the YouTube stuff. But Dylan De Simone, he might be the biggest contributor to me really kind of getting into this 49ers stuff. He got me to write on a site, which actually – Brad Graham was writing as well. So it was just like me, Brad Graham. This is before people really knew about what Brad had going on. He was kind of more just an O-line, D-line specialist type guy, more specifically offensive line. And Dylan, he he kind of, he kind got us. And he got me credentialed. I was credentialed training camps. I got credentialed for games. And my guy got married, got a new job, and was like, mm, away with this content stuff. So shout out to my guy, Dylan, though, man. Got to give him a lot of props. He got me to write when nobody else could. I said, I'm not a writer. He said, don't worry about it. I'll edit it. It'll look good. You'll be fine. Uh, But yeah, shout out to my guy, Dylan. All right, Croc, it's big board time. Let's, let's do this thing. And it might take a little while. I'm going to, I'm going to pull it up on the old, uh, on the old screen here. We're doing our 49ers draft big board. This is what we're going to be working off of when we're when we're going live and talking about the 49ers, maybe even figuring out if we want to do this shadow draft. I could use a, a, an assistant GM, Croc, doing the shadow draft if I bring it back this year. I know some folks out there are clamoring for it and asking me to do the, the shadow drafts. The 49ers have done such a good job building the team. You know, uh, the, the bulky era is what got me started doing the shadow draft. I feel like they're doing so good. Um, I, I stopped doing the shadow draft. But it's still a lot of fun. Maybe we'll bring it back this year. I, I do have a question with the the big board right now. You, and you did a great job of kind of filling in spots so that we don't have to, you know, waste a whole time, a lot of time on some of the top 10 guys. But you feel like McCarthy is a top 10 prospect in this or you just think he's okay. going top 10? This is what I wanted to start with. And I want to make sure you're OK with this. We can pull some guys off if we need to. Um, this is the consensus top eight in the draft. And I just want to have them on the board so we can get a, a more accurate look of what 32 players might be there in the first round. Gotcha. So, and I, and I think these are the, these are sort of the eight. That's why, you know, I've got it in blue one through eight. This is the order I like them in, in the one through eight, but you know, by all accounts and, and you know, the draft is always chaotic and, and who knows what it's going to end up looking like in the end. But, um, 
I think this will be the first eight players, and this is kind of the order I have them in loosely. And if you have any problems with that, we can adjust this top eight as well. But I wanted to have this eight in its own little category at the top so we could build our board behind that for who actually might be there for the 49ers because none of these eight guys will be. Joe Alt, and, and he, he deserves to be up there. He's a very interesting one. And I was listening to my guy, uh, John Medikoff, and he talked about just tall offensive linemen. And you and I, we talked about that in the past. Tall offensive linemen. Man, you lose a lot of leverage to some of these guys, to either bull rushes. And we saw a lot of this with Mike McGlinchey, another fellow uh, Notre Dame graduate who played at the on, on, the, on the line there at the offensive tackle position, six foot eight, all very similar. That's something to kind of be worried about when it comes to these offensive linemen. So he's up there. Everybody has him pretty high up there as well. But man, that's a that that's an interesting just prospect in general because of the height. What do you think of Odunze? Oh, I love Odunze, man. Um, you have him over Alt, and would you have him just right there with Neighbors and Harrison? I think he's in the right spot now. Me personally, you got Drake May, Jaden Daniels, McCarthy. I probably yeah. switch that up. I, I, I'm higher on Jaden Daniels than okay. I am Drake May, um, just off of just special uh, abilities. Now, again, you, you do want guys that are consistent. You you, you want guys that. Uh, not only can make every throw, but consistently do certain things. That was a conversation then and now with uh, one uh, golly, I'm thinking uh, Trey Lance. Damn, forgot about Trey Lance's name <laughs> already. But um, with, with Jaden Daniels, that clearly a guy who possesses a lot of talent. So I, I'd have him over Drake May if we're just you know, how's the game translate to the NFL. Those were, those were a couple of the ones I was I was wondering, and, and I was going to let you break the tie on. Was basically like uh, Odunze Alt. It could go five Odunze, uh, and or four Odunze, five Alt, and then have the quarterbacks. Do you think the quarterbacks should be above the uh, the receivers, the other quarterbacks? Because I think there's a gap between Caleb Williams where I'd put the other receivers and these other players in before. Because I'm still a little, uh, but like yeah, May and Daniels are is kind of a tie for me. So so I'll bump Daniels ahead of May for sure. And I do like McCarthy actually a little bit the more I watch him. I like him. I like McCarthy a lot better than say I liked Mac Jones, you know, four years ago. Yeah, you got some other guys up here and Brock Bowers. I actually like Brock Bowers more than as a prospect. Again, we're talking about his prospect, it, the, where they go in the draft, that may differ. But I'd say that Brock Bowers is a better prospect than McCarthy. I think he's a better prospect than Drake May. Um, uh, Arguably a better prospect than Jaden Daniels, even though he won't go as high as Jaden Daniels. Okay, let's move on past that top eight then, because I think those are in a good spot. Those guys are going to go probably the first eight picks in the draft in some order. Is Brock Bowers your next best guy then? We're going to yeah. put him in at number nine? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I've got a little block. So if we look down the list here, there's, uh, including Bowers, there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight guys here that I think are going to be gone before the 49ers pick. And I don't want to spend too much time on that order because the one, the players we've gone deep on and done deep dives on are down here. And we've got to figure out which of those players we like for the 49ers as we get down and, and finish our big board here. And then maybe even talk about how we rank the rest of them beyond the first round of the NFL draft. So after Bowers at nine, where would you go here? I would lean toward Quinion Mitchell or Dallas Turner. You know, I'd say with these guys, in, in, in no particular order, but definitely in that block, you might just be able to slide all those guys over to the left. Just straight over in this order? This is not really an order I had them in. I just knew that these were the names that right. should be over there. Yeah. Um, but, like, in some order, this is kind of like the the tier of player that we're probably going to go pretty high tonight. Brian Thomas might, might sneak down I, I don't know if he'll be necessarily for everyone brian thomas jr is an interesting one out of lsu he's got a ton of speed he's six three four three three speed uh i mean what do you have 12 did he have like 17 touchdowns he had a crazy amount of touchdowns last year at lsu um dude could get open deep but his profile has a huge bust rate in the nfl and i've seen people compare him to like denzel mims and like a a a rich man's version of Denzel Mims. Uh, I've heard. Oh, oh, oh no. See, see, so that's why sometimes. Hold on, hold on. Okay, go ahead. They'll, they'll look at things on paper and then be like, oh, this is the profile of Denzel Mims. When you watch them play, remember, I was not very high. I'm like, Mims is the stiffest player I've ever seen. Now, you look at his three cone, 
and all that, it looks like, oh, no, this is a guy that's, man, look at this change of direction. Hell no. You watch the games. He Even watch his, they got the senior bowl clips of Denzel Mims. He was so stiff, even on his releases. It was like his knees didn't even bend. His hips couldn't bend. Like, I, so you can look at profile and height and, and all that. I would go more with a guy like, um, oh, gosh, the 49ers ha- had him recently. Receiver got drafted high by the Chicago Chris Bears. Chris Conley? No. Oh, oh um, white. White. Yeah. Now, that that would be more, you know, just – uh, 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 an explosive receiver in college, you know, he had the the production, but man, like how exactly does that game exactly translate to the league? And if you have any kind of doubts or whatever, it may be more along that lines, like, man, terrific athlete, ran very fast, can, you know, can jump out the building, you know, did a lot of these things, but man, it just something about it. Now I think with white, it might've been more injuries that slowed him down. And we've seen that's all somebody talking about great, prospects and they're like oh sammy Watkins Sammy Watkins was an amazing prospect but he, he got was, hurt early well, in his career yeah he was explode he was what we're talking about with like Malik neighbors right now yeah and even then it was it 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 was freakish with how he was able to move and the things he was able to do like you you look at that class and there's Odell Beckham there's Mike Evans there's Brandon Cooks there's Devonte Adams there's all these guys and the first guy that goes is Sammy Watkins people are like oh, how that was a crazy miss but when you watch the film it was like I I get it and he got hurt too you know that so the injuries part is a part where it's hard to factor in that when it comes to these prospects but Brian Thomas I could see him being the guy that doesn't go top 15 but really starts to pick up steam around pick 18. I could see that with him. Dane Brugler in his recent mock draft. I love the fit and I love the move. He projected a trade from Buffalo going from 28 to 17 and drafting Brian Thomas. Mm. I think perfect fit for what they Feels have on right. the roster in Buffalo. Josh Allen, big arm quarterback, could make the most of a prospect like Brian Thomas. Brashad Perryman's another name that's been brought up. And that's, I think that's a better comp. It's the first round guy, crazy explosive, downfield guy. <sighs> and like there's a lot of misses with that archetype of player. Cross. See, but. but- so they do this with Xavier Worthy, and I know we'll get to Xavier Worthy and we'll talk about it. And you see four two one, you see skinny guy, slender or whatever, and then you'll start thinking of all the skinny guys, and it's like, well, did they probably play different? Like Devonte Smith played drastically different than uh, I don't know some of the other guys that they may think is a bust. But then you might bring up a name like uh, John Ross, and I can't tell you why John Ross was a bust. Like I don't know why. What he was because they think, oh, they see the speed and it's like, oh, that's all he was. John Ross at Washington was not just speed. He scored 15 touchdowns, I think, his last year. I mean, he was he was good. He was dynamic. He was explosive. When you bring up Perriman, Perriman was, I can only run in a straight line. Like, yeah. he literally could only run. And it was like, I remember this guy's going first round. Like, oh, they, they drafted this guy. Like, that's what I remember saying. You know, maybe like people had thoughts of that with AJ Jenkins. Yeah. When you compare him to Brian Thomas, I'm like, no, Brian Thomas is a different type of receiver than than them. All right, Croc likes Brian Thomas. He's uh, he's wide receiver four clearly in this class. I'd say, yeah, yeah. I'd feel uh, good about that. I, I'm gonna go Dallas Turner ten just because of the upside of what he could be as a speed rusher. He's uh, just a, a ridiculous athlete, has some length too. And he's not just uh, completely finesse. He, he he brings some heat as a, as a run defender off the edge and getting the right scheme. I love him actually in Atlanta too, which is why I think he might be the eighth pick to Atlanta because of the three-man front that Raheem Morris has used and um, seeing how some some players have really thrived in, the, in that defense in LA. And now he's head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. So I do like that connection there. I think he could sneak in and break up that top eight that we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, Quinion Mitchell over Terry on Arnold, Croc? Oh, Crocs muted. I thought I lost you for a second. My, my bad. Um, I haven't watched a lot of Mitchell yet. I have watched uh, a, a lot of Arnold, so I know more what Arnold is. Yeah. The consensus has pretty much what you're saying, Mitchell, Arnold, and then you go down a little bit further and you have Kool-Aid. I like Kool-Aid more than Arnold a little bit, but I, I don't know. That's not the popular. That's not the popular move. 
That's definitely not popular. One thing I did hear about Terry and Arnold, which was interesting, was from, uh, I think it was from Daniel Jeremiah. And he said that in a, in a meeting with Terry and Arnold there, you know, when you watch the all 22 tape, the first, the first card is the, the down and distance and stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it goes to the play. It was a third down play. Terry and Arnold sees the card, the down and distance in the game and stuff. And he stopped him right there. He knew the play that they're about to show on third down, told him what first and second down was that got him to where they were on third down and broke down the play. He didn't even see the play yet. He just saw that on the card on the down and distance. And he said he was blown away by how smart he is. And you can see how smart he plays on the field. I think some, uh, we probably got to talk when we get to AD Mitchell about some of the anonymous scout stuff, but you know, there's so much, these are human beings and Croc, you and I are, are flawed human beings. And, and we're trying to scout flawed human beings and, and the teams are flawed and, and the process is flawed and there's all these flaws going together. So when a team thinks that they can get a really clean player who they know they can count on, who's smart, who's athletic and who's going to, to be, be someone they can trust. I think that weighs a lot for these guys when you're, you're tie breaking with all these great athletes in the draft. And the, the scouts and the coaches, they're privileged to see guys in a different light, right? Like they, they could see the worst of these guys. A lot of times, you know, we might watch film and you'll see some good, you'll see some bad, you might skip over something. When you see things in person, we've kind of been teasing some Tim Tebow stories. And I sent <laughs> I sent Peacock a picture and it was like on this day, 10 years ago, or however long it was, right? It was like on this day, 10 years ago, you posted this. I think it was like 11 years ago now, but I took a picture of the field and you could see like Tim Tebow and, you know, and this is me with the Jets. And um, the thing that people weren't privileged to see with Tebow a whole lot is there's some stinky things, you know, and uh, I, I, I said to Tebow and I'm like, on this day, 11 years ago, uh, Tim Tebow was one hopping routes on the air to receivers. So when I say one hopping, that's he's dropping back. He's, you know, everybody's out there getting extra work in, in the facility. And he drops back, he throws the ball, and it's just in the dirt. I, and, and I saw it multiple times. And I'm like, I, Tim Tebow, this is, when I stepped in, okay, first of all, you guys got to remember, like, I was a fan of football, okay? I, I wasn't someone that was just like, oh, man, you always thought you would make it to the NFL? Absolutely not. Like, never even, you know, from Pop Warner to high school, I never thought it. So I'm there. I'm a huge fan of it. And I see certain guys, and it's like Antonio Camardi, he introduced himself. It's cool. And then Tim Tebow walks in the locker room. And I get a little starstruck, you know? And then you see him just throwing routes on the air to the dirt. And you're like, my whole life is a lie. <laughs> you know, my whole life is a lie. Like, what version of Tim Tebow is this? But coaches probably saw a lot of that. You know, and this thing, this thing with Trey Lance. I don't know what everybody's seeing, right? But there's a reason they were just like, oh, let's just trade him. Tim Tebow ended up eventually got cut um, shortly after the one hops you know, on, on air. Uh, but I was able to see that most people weren't. So there's some things with some of these prospects that behind the scenes, even with Terry on Arnold and how smart he is, I could try to pick that up on film. But until you get in front of these people and you hear them talk and you listen to them, you see the way they carry themselves. You don't you don't get to know as much as some of the other people. I, I can't believe they drafted Tebow in the first round. He he did not have an NFL starting NFL quarterback arm. He didn't even have a backup quarterback arm. And and I don't know what the pr thought process was for what they thought he was going to be as a quarterback because the teams weren't running. You know, even the the pistol stuff and any of that at that point yet. And he's not even that athletic to be running away from guys necessarily. Um, you can see a lot of pop passes, uh, you know, and so good college player, but he was not an NFL quarterback. I thought he was a third round tight end uh, coming into the draft. And I was blown away. A team was like, I think Brandon Whedon was 30 years old as a rookie. He played like minor league baseball, then went back to school. And then he was like, he just old. He's like, you're going to draft Brandon Whedon in the first round. Johnny Manziel is another one. It wouldn't touch that guy in the first round. What are we doing here? There were some really easy misses that teams could have avoided. I think teams are better at avoiding those ridiculous misses now. I, I just think there's well, we say that, but and, and this is not to dog McCarthy, but we got McCarthy right now in the top 10. And just watching him, right? Like you could watch players, you watch you you watch Caleb Williams, and you just see, like, man, 
it feels like a top 10 player. Oh man, it feels like best quarterback in college football. Yeah. You, you, you watch Jaden Daniels. And even though it kind of came out of nowhere, you know, he's like fifth year senior, or whatever he is, and he left the school, and it's like, ah, does he, you know, but you're watching him and you're like, man, it feels like he should go high. I don't think he's going to go high, but it feels like he should. And then fast forward, he wins Heisman and he's probably going to be number two overall pick. At no point watching JJ McCarthy did I think, oh, this is like, look how he did this. This is a top 10 prospect. Like I, I never said that, <laughs> you know, like I just, just watching and not anybody could, you know, you're watching the games and it's like, yeah, and that didn't come to my mind at all with McCarthy. And I think with a lot of these guys and you talk about the weed ends, you talk about the Tim Tebow's, you, you watch it enough. You meet with them. You, you, you hear things enough. You can talk yourself into like a, liking a guy more and, and, and kind of reaching. I don't even think that was the case with Trey Lance. Like there were a lot of people that felt like, oh man, this is going to be a big time quarterback. He just did, couldn't play again. Right. It was just, you wanted to see that next season. And he was considered like one of the guys heading into the year. They never got that season. So you never got to see like the confirmation of what he potentially could be or him, you know, get that more, uh, those more reps that he clearly needed. But with some of these other guys, they're just talking themselves into it. I think McCarthy is one of those guys. I don't think he's as clearly like not an NFL quarterback. I like McCarthy as a later first round guy. And like I said before, I like him better than I like him better now than I like Mac Jones a few years ago. Did you uh, watch McCarthy though and say, oh, this is a first round quarterback? I thought this is an NFL, I, I thought this is a good like I to be honest with you, what I thought is Shanahan would love this guy. That's what I thought. <laughs> well, then that's a six round quarterback. <laughs> well, he, 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 he liked he just likes pro style quarterbacks, right? He's only drafted and until Brock Purdy, uh, and, and I don't even know what offense you would consider that that they're running in uh, at Iowa State. But the only two quarterbacks he had drafted was the only two quarterbacks that have come out of like pro style systems in the last eight years, because Iowa and North Dakota State are the only two teams that ran like still kind of old school quote unquote pro style systems, and he drafted the quarterbacks for those two schools. Uh, and that's what Harbaugh was was running at Michigan. So that's why I kind of thought that about him. And I think and was, Iowa. Did you did you say Bethard? Uh Bethard from Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Iowa and North Coast State. There's only two schools. Okay. Yeah. That were, they were running the you know, pro style schemes. Um you see, I gotta have them. I like there's something to McCarthy. I think he's got arm talent. I think he's big. I think he's athletic. I think he's tough. Uh and he makes throws when they need him. They didn't lean on him. You know, his highlight reel might not be as good. And you know, he he didn't put up a Heisman level uh production season like Jaden Daniels did, but he's got a lot that you need to be a good quarterback in the NFL. And I definitely like him better than Mac Jones. So if Mac Jones can go 15, JJ McCarthy can definitely go top eight. Uh, I don't know about spending three first round picks to trade up to number four for him. Like the Minnesota Vikings might do. That's a different story, but it does seem like he's going to go that high. And you know, you get, you get an extra bump for being a, a quarterback, but, or, or maybe he's the guy that slides. Maybe we're looking at him and he's still on the board when the 49ers are picking and a team goes up to get him. Who knows? There's always going to be something. There's, we can't tell you what's going to happen. We think that, you know, those guys are locked in the top eight, which is why we put them there. But, I mean, the draft is nuts. No idea yeah. what's going to happen next Thursday. Okay, Croc. So this is what I've got so far down to the top 17. And this puts us in the tier of players where um, we have to start putting the guys we've done deep dives on either in front of these guys or after these guys and build our big board here through top 32 and then probably some some bonus players as well. So after that top eight, and if you're just joining us, that top eight is because I think they're locked into the top eight in this draft. I don't think we should even argue about where they are. And we want to have the guys in front of the where the 49ers pick so we have a better idea of who might be there for the 49ers as we build this thing out. So Caleb Williams, one, Marvin Harrison Jr., two, Malik Neighbors, three, Joe Alt, four, Roma Dunze, five, Jane Daniels, seven, uh, six. I've got those out of order. Um, and Drake May, seven, and J.J. McCarthy, eight. And then we have Brock Bowers, nine, Dallas Turner, ten, Quinion Mitchell, 11. Olu Fashanu out of Penn State, offensive tackle, 12. Leatu Latu, who I like a lot. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what the medicals are going to say, but dude's ready to come in and probably lead all rookies in sacks. 
Uh, I saw him, him mock to the 49ers at 31. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mm, seems a little low. Uh, I have a kid that I train at UCLA. He's a cornerback, and he speaks very highly of Latu. I mean, he's yeah, he he's definitely a, a first round guy all day if the the medical checks out. But you know, I think the neck surgery he had and he's been fine. He's played both of the last two seasons, but had to medically retire before that before he got it got it right and figured out. And I think there's a track record for people having that surgery and, and, and being right and being able to play in the NFL. But maybe that's the why why he would fall to the 49ers. And would they say, well, we'll take the risk there if he does fall. So you know, and a good again, anything can happen in the NFL draft. But you know, just just based on the player he is, I'd put him right here. And you know, maybe he, he could still end up being the first defensive player on the board and he could slide because of that reason. Terry and Arnold 14, Jared Verse, Florida State 15, Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU wide receiver. Wide receiver four, 16, Byron Murphy, defensive tackle out of Texas. Feels like he's going to be the no doubt first defensive tackle off the board in this draft at 17, which brings us to the guys we've done deep dives on. In a, and one of our favorites, Croc, that is Talise Fuaga. Where would you put him? Would you put him at 18? Would you put him ahead of any of the guys that are currently on the list? Or would you put somebody else that we've done deep dives on here, even ahead of Fuaga? You're muted again. My bad. I, I definitely would have him. I think that's about right. I think that's about right. I'm looking at some of the names and seeing how people would kind of you know, put that in order. But I, I would say he's 18, 19, feels right for Fuaga. I really like Fuaga. I think it's a good place for him. People are putting him in, in top 10. I think that might be a little rich as much as I like him. Just because, you know, shorter arms, I think some teams might think he's a guard. He might be a right tackle only, whereas someone like Olu Fashinu uh, was a was a left tackle. By the way, so on Locked On 49ers that we just recorded before this, we talked about A.D. Mitchell, and we'll get into the anonymous scouts and some of the, the stuff about him and his diabetes. And uh, there was a quote from Bob McGinn's article from an anonymous scout about Olu Fashinu. And the, the scout said, uh, he's got girl hands because his hands are eight and a half inches. He's got long enough arms. He's got everything. He's prototype just has like smaller hands for someone that's usually his size. Most of these guys have like 10 inch hands, like monster hands. My hands are pretty big. I'm six, four. My hands are like nine and a half. And uh, he's got eight and a half inch hands. And the scouts like, oh, he's got girl hands. And it's like, come on, dude. Like, what are we doing here? And some of these scouts, when I hear the quotes from the anonymous scouts, it's like, who hired this dude? I would hope that the team that I, cover wouldn't hire this imbecile but some of the stuff is like man it's legit that's tough you know you, it, so it, it, these guys are anonymous so they don't have to put their name on it so they can say, say some wild stuff but um anyway all that is to say olu fashnu is a left tackle and i think that might be a difference for someone like talise fuaga mims guyton all these guys played right tackle and you could project them to the left side but they haven't seen them there yet and i think there is still a difference for some teams depending on what you're looking for they might want a left tackle versus a right tackle and that hurts fuaga as well all right so this is going to be difficult here we're on to number 19 on our list who do you think is the next best prospect in this draft truck We've got Johnny Newton, Kool-Aid McKinstry, who I know you love, Amarius Mims, Chop Robinson, Darius Robinson, A.D. Mitchell, Lad McConkey, Kinsley Suomata'ia, uh, Graham Barton. These are not in any ranked order. This might be the order we we watched them in. I can't remember. I just kind of threw them in here. Um, Jordan Morgan, Xavier Worthy, Nate Wiggins, corner out of Clemson, Cooper DeGene out of Iowa, Xavier Leggett, uh, Max Melton, Zach Frazier, Tyler Guyton, we're kind of going down to guys that probably are not going to get first round grades from us here. Roger Rosengarten. I, I, I think we kind of know who who's next. I think it's Nate Wiggins. I, I think he's a guy that people are really high on. A lot of people had him at kind of like pegged in that CB two range. I think the way he went out there and tested. I think Backstab obviously he's a little light in the ass, but I is, think he's a guy that fits in that range. Is he next for you, or are you? projecting this as consensus because this is our big board i don't care what people are going to think about these guys from here on out this is our board now crap yeah i'd say he's next for me yeah Nate Wiggins? yeah oh yeah now, you know, judging, by our, like more, but... judging by our episode i thought you were a little lower on wiggins than that okay that's interesting i would have yeah i'm okay with wiggins here let's go wiggins and I, and I think I have the next guy ready as well. 
Is it Cooper DeJean? It is Cooper DeJean. Okay. But can you just put DB? I, I will put DB. Now, this is a big board for the 49ers, Croc. I, I think I think that what he does, like what he brings and what he can bring to a defense, what he can bring to the 49ers defense, I feel like it should be highly valued. I don't think it's just, oh, it's just a receiver. Oh, it's just a corner. When you think of all the different things he does, and then you start to add in even the extra stuff with the special teams value. I, I think what he can be, I mean, you think, um, you know, um, 22 from Minnesota Vikings is safety. And I'm not saying that because they're both white guys, but. Harrison, yeah. yeah. You know, like that that kind of player, right? Like with just tremendous ball skills, a knack for, you know, being able to play and understand things, jump things with his eyes. Uh, a terrific tackler, a guy like just the impact that he's able to have. You know, obviously we're not saying he's top 10 worthy, but I think if you're viewing him from that perspective, this is a guy that should be highly valued for the 49ers. Now, if you're viewing him as a cornerback, then we could drop him out in the first round. I, I wouldn't have him in my top 32. But the 49ers say, man, oh man, I, I, I love what this Cooper DeGene brings and how I see him being able to work kind of like a Jimmy Ward that actually makes plays, I mean, picks the ball off. Jimmy Ward makes plays. You know, gets you the interceptions, and potentially can be a big-time safety. That was what you and I talked about. Okay, just, you know, you want a guy that's, you know, good. You could draft offensive linemen, you know, Graham Barton and Sua Mataia. You know, you have all these guys that can be good. You have a safety that can be an all-pro. Like that kind of guy, that kind of impact. And, and I feel like for me, I value that and what it would mean to the 49ers defense that people want to see be better. I'm looking at my list right now and realizing Troy Fautanu is not in there yet. So I'm going to write his name in there because I think he's going to make an appearance at some point very soon. Just wanted to make sure I remedied that one. Um. So this is for the 49ers, Croc. If, if Cooper DeGene was drafted next Thursday to the 49ers, where does he play? Because they don't currently have that role you're drawing up for Cooper DeGene. I think Cooper he's your starting DeGene. safety. I think he's your starting safety, and he's your 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 uh, nickel uh, uh, on on those downs. And go ahead, bring in Jair Brown, and you know to go with uh, you know whatever other safety for now is want to plug in. Obviously it depends on health a little bit there, but keep, go ahead and keep our, our, our guy, uh, Lenore at he cornerback. Would, and he, interesting one from invader DeGene would be Staley's star. Now Staley isn't the defensive coordinator for the 49ers. It's Nick Sorensen, but, um, Derwin James, is that how he was used in that chargers defense? He, he kind of was, yeah. They, I mean, they had him do a lot of coverage stuff on tight ends, but he also was back there. I mean, I remember his rookie year, him blitzing off the edge against the 49ers. He kind of wrecked the game his rookie year. Remember, the 49ers played in the game, and you had um, C.J. Beathard at quarterback. And it was it was a good game, actually. It kind of ended up being a good game, but I just remember the impact that Derwin James had. Now, I do believe that Derwin James was a top-10 prospect, and I don't think that Cooper DeGene is a top-10 prospect. But when you're starting to get around – you know, 20th prospect, I think Cooper DeGene, as a star player, I think that's a good spot for him. Starting free safety with Hufanga, he drops down to nickel. Jair Brown comes in at safety over the top. Yep. That's the plan. He's he's the Jimmy Ward. He's the Derwin James. He's the star player. And he's a starter, every down player in that role. So essentially, we're talking about a safety nickel as the 20th overall player in this draft. Yeah. Okay. Now, now Fatano, Fatano, I, I think, you know, and I see some people in the chat. I oh, was way too far back. We could probably plug him in. <laughs> we could plug him in right now. <laughs> I I mean, he's a he's not a perfect prospect. Um and we we could put him in. We could drop down these two DBs, Croc, and we could put him here and we could put Troy Fatano in ahead of him. I wouldn't be mad at that. Yeah, I think that's the right spot. Right after. 
uh, right after, there we go, Fuaga. So we got Fuaga, Fautanu, back-to-back, then Wiggins, then Dejean. I like it. I would argue Croc next for Johnny Newton, defensive tackle out of Illinois. We oh, both I thought you were going to go Chop Robinson there. I like Chop. Chop Chop's coming up soon for me. Um, do you like Chop better than Johnny Newton? I think I, if, you, if you dare to dream what they could be, Chop could be better. Johnny Newton right now is a better pass rusher. And I think the 49ers might... 49ers have less invested in tackle long term than they do edge after this offseason and what they've done. I feel like they're gearing up more for tackle. Now it shouldn't matter. You want to take the best player here. Uh I think um Mims is a is a scary player, but if he hits, he deserves to be in this area. Mims is a scary I I I again we're, we're talking about for the 49ers. The inexperience and injury history scare, scares me a bit. Bigger body, how does that fit with what the 49ers had traditionally gone with? And so there was a stat I saw because he only started, um, he started eight games in his career. And of those eight games, he didn't play the full game in some of them. So he's played like six full games. And then... He's only had, uh, I think the number is 104, what they call true pass sets. 104 true pass sets in his college career where his quarterback actually dropped back like a normal passer and he had to pass protect like a normal offensive tackle. That is not much to go on. But he was surprisingly not that raw looking in those reps that he was, which which is, and he's a freak of nature. You can't find these guys. Like go to Target right now. Tell me how many guys you see that are six foot six plus that can move someone like an offensive tackle in the NFL can, right? You go to the you go to the you go to Target, you might see someone that's shaped like a corner. You might see someone that's shaped like Nate Wiggins, right? But you just don't see guys that are shaped like a Marius Mims that can move at the level you need to. They 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 they're rare, they don't exist. So um, but that being said. There's a lot of boomer bust there. I think I'd wait on him. I think the next two, though, Croc, are Johnny Newton and Chop, and I'd probably put him in that order. I think Croc's dog is going crazy here. Uh, oh, here we go. Jesse's in the in the chat. Um, last second sports. Check it out. Please sell me on Chop because I do not see it at all, especially at 31, athletic and so inconsistent in my opinion. The the thing I like about Chop is, first of all, the get off, and that's the Chris Kosarek thing. He's going to love that. Um, I think he shows traits, and this is kind of the Dallas Turner thing that I talked about a little bit earlier as well. Chop shows ridiculous traits that you just can't find in some of these other rushers with how he gets off the line and the pressure he can put on an offensive tackle. Um, he's shown an ability to get around the corner. These Dude, these... I don't know what they're doing at Penn State. They have Micah Parsons. He's playing off-ball linebacker. They had Jason Owe. He had zero sacks and went late first round to the Ravens a few years ago. He's developed into a better player uh, in the NFL than he was a, a pass rusher. Like Penn State just doesn't care about sacks, doesn't care about pass rush. They're like, play the run on the way to the quarterback. And these offenses, this is why I like NFL football more than college football. I can't stand watching college football because of the spread offenses. And I, there's reps where Chop Robinson insta sack beats his guy round the corner, gets to the quarterback as fast as you can humanly possibly get to the quarterback. He's got the ball out because they're just throwing screen passes all day long. And do, do you think it's a little Josh? <clears throat> excuse me. Do you think it's a little Josh Allen this? <clears throat> Chop? Yeah, because, because I'm that? looking at my scouting report. Yeah. And it's like wants to win with speed. Uh, more so than any type of like hand technique, uh, isn't in the edge setter. Uh, he can win with immediate quickness in the run game. Uh, did have a nice ball rush versus Ohio State left tackle, is consistent. Uh, if he doesn't win with speed versus the run, he struggles to uh, to have any power to blow a play up. Uh, gets moved wherever the offensive lineman wants to take him. 
And then I said, if you want to like him, watch the Michigan film because he just destroyed that tackle, like really all came. So it was like, if you want to think of what the potential high end of him is and you want to value him here at, let's say, 22, like, go watch the Michigan film. But the, it felt like there was a little bit more inconsistency with what he potentially is versus running. And maybe that's just me, you know, watching the 49ers and – like, you know, oh, man, you have – you're getting blown up in the run game, the on the pin and pulls and all these different things. I feel like that's where the 49ers – that's why I think I'm higher on, like, Darius Robinson. I mean, we've had this discussion, yeah. though. I'm higher on Darius than Chop. And if you want someone to set the edge, Darius Robinson's your guy in this draft, but he just doesn't have the juice that Chop Robinson has. And I like Darius Robinson a lot, and I think I'd probably just put him right here after that. Um, but, but well, Josh, real quick, the, the unfair part that I just said, oh, you know, little Josh Allen is Josh Allen still had like 17 sacks, and Josh like, Allen top, went top, top 10, right? The so Chop is up to the challenge as a run defender, which I like. He's not a finesse player, he he he, I like the way he plays, I like the way he's just not that big, he's 254 pounds, and you know, so big players are gonna envelop him. Um, but I, I, he's a dynamic athlete. I, I like the way he shoots gaps. I like the way he, uh, washes down the, the line of scrimmage and wrecks plays. And I think there's a lot of times when I was watching chops film where he's affecting the play, he would have had NFL sacks that weren't college sacks because like I mentioned, they're throwing screens, getting the ball out in one second. Um, I think it's the way they coach their D line, play the run on the way to the quarterback as well. Uh, at Penn State, and he's affecting plays and wrecking some plays where you know maybe he doesn't get the tackle behind the line, maybe he doesn't get the sack, but he's putting some pressure on the quarterback. He's winning in his uh, in his pass rush rep. That's what I saw, and I'm daring to dream with Chop Robinson what he could be. You know, D Ford sort of a role for the 49ers. I think he'd absolutely be that. And also a thing that Darius Robinson does not have that Chop has is the ability to run down fast quarterbacks and keep them from getting out of the pocket. So on one hand, Darius Robinson's much better at setting the edge and more powerful. But uh, if an athletic quarterback's trying to get out of there, Darius Robinson's not going to be able to chase him down to the sideline. He's going to get the corner and go. Chop Robinson can chase that guy down. I think if I'm the 49ers, I need to go with what I feel like is going to translate and I can have a clear vision of how exactly this fits in and my defense, and is going to be consistent. And you got to also remember, everybody that's listening right now, when you start to get to the 22nd prospect, most of these teams don't have 32 first-round grades. On right. God. This, so you're, this you're, is the area. The, like 20-inch yeah. is usually kind of the average, um, which, to be honest with you, okay, <laughs> we'll go on a tangent here really quick. And it, 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 I promise we'll get through these, and, and we'll have this ranked out. We only have 10 more to go before we get to 31, by the way. Um, we know every year there's going to be 32 first round picks, right? So I think we should be able to, as a society, normalize what a first round pick is to mean the top 32 players most years. It's always bothered me a little bit, but people are like, ah, there's only 20 first round grades every year. Well, it's like, well, that's not a first round grade then. Cause we know there's 32 picks. We know next year there's going to be 32 picks. So a first round grade should be, should be normalized for 32 picks. You know what I mean? So that's always kind of well, frustrating. No, the, the, the I, one understand, I, think, I understand the concept of the first, the quote unquote first round grades. And there's always like 20 or so of those guys. And uh, my, our guy, Dane, how they get their grades. That's the question. They, they get the grades based off of the film. They get like a number value on things that they do. And then that gives them like, oh, okay, this is a first round guy. And, right. and then that's how they make their board. But it should be like, oh, man, there's only 27 first-round grades this year. This is not a good draft. Oh, there's 40 first-round grades. This is a great draft. That would make more sense for what a first-round grade is because we know how long the first round right. is. I think we should just rename it to something else and not call it a first-round grade. Because when I say first-round, I usually break it up into parts. So when I'm talking about Darius Robinson, I was like, I oh, have late first-round grade. He, he might not be in a team's top 20 and be quote unquote first round grade for what teams are talking about when they say first round grade. But for me, it's a first round grade because there's 32 sinking picks in the first round and he should be one of them. That said, <laughs> that's it. Uh, so in, in a row right now for me, 
is probably Johnny Newton, Chop Robinson, Darius Robinson. In the role right now for me would be Darius Robinson, Johnny Newton, Chop Robinson. Okay. But we're in the same neighborhood with those guys. Yeah. What about Graham Barton? He's is he there for you yet? Uh, a little bit lower because I'm looking at Barton. I'm looking at Xavier Worthy. I'm looking at Morgan. Uh, you know, I'm looking at AD Mitchell on, on the field, not oh, uh, taking into account the stuff yeah. off the field. I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna get Jackson Powers Johnson out of here and put him up here higher so we can see him because he's he's I don't want to lose him down at the bottom. He deserves to be going. Uh, up here at some point pretty quick and i could buy the argument jackson powers johnson belongs in this neighborhood uh as well um all right so i have taken the advice of my assistant gm on some picks uh and this time i'm gonna override him since i am <laughs> GM. and it's johnny newton 22 chop 23 darius robinson 24 i have no issues with that and of those players, the most likely to fall is Johnny Newton just because he had the Liz Frank or whatever it was. It wasn't able to work out. I love the tape. I think I know what he work, would have worked out. He never had the official times, which could, you know, which I think is why he's going to be DT2 instead of DT1. Let me ask you this real quick, Quack, talking about Darius Robinson. What if we just said Darius Robinson, the race last season, he was never, he didn't play defensive end last year. He's been a tackle. He's staying a tackle. We're going to put 5, 10 pounds on his 285 pounds. He already was that. Uh, at Missouri earlier in his career, he's only he's a defensive tackle, purely. He what would be lower for me. Okay, you like him as the big end sets the edge, can then can move him around. You like him as more of an Eric Armstead kind of yeah. replacement player. That's a lot of conversation with me and uh, uh, Cooper DeJean. Like, if you're saying, "Oh, you're just a corner because that's what you played," then I'd be like, "Okay, well, he's he's not." on our board yet. But if you're telling me like, Oh no, Crock, like you could use him how you see fit. And the same thing with Darius Robinson. That's when I'm like, okay, I, I value this more. I see this like right now, you, you putting together four hours defense and you have Nick Bosa and then you have Hargraves and, you know, you have all those guys that they just signed Collins and Malik Collins and all those guys. And Oh man, by the way, we got Darius Robinson on the edge. Like to me, like, Oh, that's sexy right there. Like I, I can, I can get with that. Then go ahead and bring in Leonard Floyd and slide Robinson inside. Like I, I like that. <laughs> uh, before you force me to put Kool Aid in here, I slid Jackson Powers Johnson in at twenty five. You want to go Kool Aid at twenty six? Uh, I want to go Graham Barton. You got Barton before Kool Aid? Yeah. Okay. Th this is tight between these two centers. They're different styles of players. I'm not really going to give extra credit, though, to Graham Barton for playing tackle because I don't think he's going to play tackle in the NFL. So if we're talking about guard center type of a player, I think Jackson Powers Johnson's the better player. I think he's the more. Um, I think I value him more than actually. I, 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 I value Barton more than Jackson Powers Johnson, to be honest. You do? you Because this is me projecting him as the center. I, I don't think he's going to play tackle in the NFL. Well, so it's, it's the tackle, center, tackle. It's guard. I'm not going to give him credit for something he's not going to do in the NFL. Tackle center guard. Yeah. I think he's a center. I think he's going to be play center and maybe a little guard, um, but I like him better at center. But just Jackson Powers Johnson has more power, and he's got athleticism. I think he's just got a higher upside to be like that Pro Bowl perennial player where Graham Barton could be as well. I, I just think the upside's better for Jackson Powers Johnson. Gotcha. That's how I feel about it. That's why versatility, like the versatility of a player might – it's like, not crap. Okay, sometimes a guy just plays a position and plays it very well. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. That's why I'm looking at those guys. So, and then Kool Aid? Uh, maybe go with uh, Sua Mataia. You like Sua Mataia? Okay. This is interesting because Sua Mataia is a little bit more of a project in the MIMS sort of a mold. When we did our um, locked on mock draft croc, I think we would have gone MIMS at that point over Sua Mataia. Would you not go Mims over Sue Amata E anymore? I, I think just the longer we think about it, and I think it's to think of what Mims can potentially be. I, I like that. But then, man, you start, you, especially if you're the 49ers, you have to pay attention to the red flags. Like you have to pay attention to, you know, lack of any type of consistency being on the field, lack of experience, 
you know, injury history, the weight, like to me, those are all things where it's like, I don't want to have to worry about those things and project that to the next level. Yeah, there's just too much. There's too many questions. And to be honest with you, Kingsley Suomatsu, he has got a ton of upside as well. Like he's a darn near carbon copy of his cousin Pene Sul, height, weight, speed, and the things that they're they tested they tested so similar on all of these height, arm length, hand size, athleticism. Suomatsu was just a tick faster than Sul. Uh, his he did one more bench press rep, thirty one to thirty. These guys are just you know strong, country strong. They're naturally strong dudes, and he's so athletic. I saw him out. There's a play against Texas Croc where he's out on the move. And he absolutely annihilates a, a DB coming down to make a play. And he's, it's like, it's, I'm not going to put Trent Williams on him or anything like that, but it's reminiscent of that kind of size, a guy that can move like that and, and, and alter his body. It's usually a big man when they get moving, they're going that direction. And that's it. He like gets out of the way. Like he's the running back. There's these two guys over here. He gets out of the way here, then goes back and hits a guy and helicopters him. I mean, it's like, he's got ability his tape, his tape is a little rough at times. He's a little bit of a project. It might take some time, but he has all the ability. Sua Mata I'm talking about here. He has all the ability to stick at tackle in the NFL, which is key to me, which is why I have him over the Jordan Morgans and why I have him over a lot of other players. Um, and he might not be ready to go right away, but even with the talent he has, I think he might be able to even by week one through one training camp with Chris Furster take Colton McKibben's job. And then eventually, maybe even he replaces Trent Williams when Trent Williams moves on. And he's played, even though he's a, a, a redshirt sophomore, and he's not a finished product, there's work to do. You know, like Chop Robbins is not a finished product. Um, I, I like what he can be and the fact that he's a, that he can stick a tackle in the NFL and has the traits to do so. And you see some, you see him pop on tape and you see like, okay, that's, I like that. Uh, even though it's inconsistent and he needs some technique work. That's why I like Suomata Ia. So Niners are on the clock at 31. Kool-Aid's on the board. Kingsley's on the board. You going Kingsley? Oh. Because that's what we're doing here. That's the exercise. Yeah. Ooh, because, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll go off the line. All right. There we go. I was, I'm shocked by this, Croc. Is it Kool-Aid time now? You know what? I, I don't think it's Kool-Aid time. I think it's Xavier Worthy time. I, I think it's Xavier Worthy time. Whoa, okay. okay. Kyle has been thirsty for the speed guy. He he's been thirsty for that. Like he wants that guy. But and what he's been kind of swinging. It's like you know what? I'm tired of trying to get that with the Marquis Goodwins. I'm tired of trying to get that guy with a borderline fourth round pick and Danny Gray, who is really kind of only a straight line speed guy and even doesn't even play fast. Let me get a real difference making speed guy that runs terrific routes, plays fast, and, and watch them. They use him as a weapon as well. Just how many screens did they throw to Xavier Worthy at Texas? You know, a guy that – fastest guy ever at the combine, but don't let that – don't let that taint what he can be as a technician running routes. You know, this is a guy that can clearly be a big-time difference maker, even if you have Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel. Like, he just brings something so much different that those guys don't have. Something that he's been, again, he's been looking for, but hasn't been able to find that guy. I think he he brings that element. And if you lose a Debo or an Ayuk in, in the following year, or however that works out, I mean, I think we're talking more Deshaun Jackson than anything else. So I, I, I really like him, especially you talking about this range, pick 31. It's kind of hard to pass up on a guy that has that much natural talent. Shocked by you, Croc. Going Xavier Worthy here over Kool-Aid McKinstry. But you sold me on it. All right. Here we go. I, I think you can find corners that are like, oh, man, this is, this is, be, this is a good – it could be a cool, good corner. All right. Can you find a guy like – man, this could be a special player in this offense. And I felt like that with Cooper DeGene, right? Like just yeah. as a DB, like, okay, he could be a special guy in the 49ers defense as a DB, not so much as a corner. I, I think that Xavier Worthy could 
truly be a difference maker, like a special player in in the 49ers offense with everything else that you have going on. So Even we, if that means 25 catches like you get from Jawan Jennings, but man, those 25 catches for 21 yards per catch, <laughs> you know? There's only three more slots here in, in the first round of our 49ers big board croc. At what point is it worth it for Amarius Mims? Let's say the first 29 picks are already gone. Uh, and now we only have left the players that are uh, on uh, on the right side of the screen here. We got Amarius Mims. We got Jordan Morgan. We got A.D. Mitchell. We got Lad McConkey. Uh, we got Zach Frazier. We got Tyler Guyton. Uh, I think Patrick Paul is someone we are intrigued by, Croc, uh, of the taller, bigger offensive tackles in this draft. Uh, Mike Sanders still, I, I've heard a lot of people getting pretty interested in him. Uh, oh, you know what we did? We forgot JT, J.C. Latham, Croc. Yeah. We're going to have to remedy this. So we're actually a little further down the list than I thought. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where does J.C. Latham go, Croc? He goes earlier. Earlier than uh, he, goes so in, he goes in the t- early 20s. Range. He probably goes ahead of... I probably put him ahead of Wiggins, to be honest. Yeah, right ahead of Wiggins and after Feltanu. Just yeah, because right, he doesn't right. fit great with Kyle Shanahan's scheme, I think. But he deserves to be there as a player. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm glad I caught that. I hope there's no more stragglers. Let me double check the list here. We got Roger Rosengarten, who I'm going to put up here just because we need to have that conversation. Don't want to miss him. TJ Tampa, Marshawn Neeland. Let, let's talk about them. Let's talk through some of these other players uh, and why they're not going to end up on our list. And I don't think either one of them are. By the way, you can hear the latest Lockdown 49ers where we go a little bit deeper on, on Marshawn Neeland. Okay, so let's just move all these guys down one. J.C. Latham goes right in here at 20. All right. We're going a little, like, uh, skill position heavy here, but – and I think I saw Jesse in the chat talking about uh, A.D. Mitchell and, and Kyle maybe liking him a lot, but Lab McConkey. I, I made a tweet last month that I've identified three wide receivers, and I was right on Debo, and I was right on – uh, I was right on Brandon Ayuk that they were Kyle Shanahan receivers and they got drafted. This is before those drafts. And the three names I listed were Malachi Corley, Lad McConkey, and Ricky Pearsall in this draft. Um, I do think he would like the Texas boys for sure for multiple reasons. Um, I got excited watching Lad McConkey's film. And the, 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 the production... It's different, right? It, it's it's not a team that's just dropping back, throwing the ball everywhere. They now they throw the, a little bit more than they have in past years <laughs> this year, but still not the same as a lot of other teams. So McConkey's production, I, I think it kind of took a hit because of the offense and you know the style and how many times they looked to get the ball in the Brock Bowers' hands. But I mean, why did Ad Mitchell leave Georgia? I mean, I can't play over Lad McConkey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's there's probably something to it. Um, on the AD Mitchell thing, there's the I don't know if, if Jesse and I don't know if the listeners have heard it, and we talked about it on the the latest Locked On Forty Niners. Uh, it's kind of a wild report from scouts about AD Mitchell and and some stuff about why he's so consistent inconsistent in college. AD Mitchell. 10 of his 14 games, Croc, A.D. Mitchell had three or fewer catches. And we talked about how on film there's like the half-speed stuff. And remember, and I was like, man, I don't know what to do with A.D. Mitchell because some of the stuff you love, but he scares me in a boomer bust kind of way. And I would want to talk to him and ask him, what's going on with these routes? You know, are they coaching it to you this way? And then you hear the scouts talk about his diabetes. So he's got type 1 diabetes, and he hasn't been... What was your... By the way, Nurse Crocky. Eric's wife showed up in the podcast to let us know she's a nurse. What, what's going on with with diabetes? What does she call it? The term she used about being uh, compliant. Compliant, yeah, being compliant to you know your your condition. 
and he's like not been a compliant he's not taking care of it he's not been mature about it so immaturity stuff with him and um so he's been a bad teammate and you know uh uncoachable and all of these things and then doesn't take his diabetes seriously and then he's like in a bad mood he can't practice but then when he gets his diabetes medicine right by lunchtime he's feeling okay and then he's a great teammate and then he loves football and then he's an awesome player and i mean there's just a lot going on and, and she didn't say that and, and i want to make sure this clear yeah. she didn't say that um like oh i went draft him because he's diabetic her thing was just right. if he's not compliant with it she did say that him being an athlete and working out as much as he does really helps that, you know, okay, you're a diabetic, but man, you work out a lot. So that helps whatever you have going on. Uh, but if you're going to invest a lot of money in him, you do want to make sure that he is compliant with maybe not eating as much sweets as, you know, you know, you don't want him to eat as much sweets as a non-diabetic, or you want to make sure that he is someone that is on top of it and taking care of it as well as, you know, doing the workouts and things like that. And she's like, you want, she wouldn't have an issue with it. But she also said, and this is close to home because my wife sees me coach a lot. She said, but if they're saying he's not coachable, it's not a player she would draft. And to Invader's point in the chat, Shanahan will get all the dirt from his buddy, Steve Sarkeesian. And he's apparently been in the building at Texas. He's friends with Steve Sarkeesian. He's going to get the inside dirt. It's his alma mater. And for that reason, Xavier Worthy, I think, might be his guy even over A.D. Mitchell if this is the dirt he's getting from from Steve Sarkeesian. And by the way, Steve Sarkeesian's run an offense where Xavier Worthy was more productive than A.D. Mitchell in that offense. That doesn't mean he's better. What was your – you used a really good example, Croc. What yeah. You, I, I, I used the example of Cal Berkeley receivers. And, uh, you know, as a lot of you know, I, I coach at Edison High School. And our receiver coach, none other than Cal legend – all right, my guy, Lavelle Hawkins. And Hawk, you know, went on, played, you know, six years in the NFL, did very well for himself. Uh, but, you know, we start talking about production and, you know, you throw out some receivers and, oh, this guy's more productive than this guy. Lavelle was actually more productive than Deshaun Jackson the year that they both came out of Cal Berkeley. They came out the same year. Lavelle was more productive. Lavelle ended up being a fourth-round pick. Now, also, there's a difference here, too. I think Lavelle would have been a higher pick if it had ran a faster 40. So he ended up being a fourth-round pick because he ran a 4.57 at six foot, you know, roughly 200 pounds or 5'11 and a half, 200 pounds. So, oh, 4.57, okay, uh, you're more of a, you know, day three, early day three guy. Uh, where D-Jack, light in the ass, 5'11, 165, mm -hmm. but he just ran much better. If Lavelle would have ran 4.47, would he have still been a fourth-round pick? Maybe would have been higher, higher than... DJ based on production, eh, maybe not, but that just goes to show can't go all on production. Those were two guys at the same school, and Lavelle he was out there doing his thing, and still was drafted later than Deshaun Jackson, who people viewed as just more talented. And by the way, that's the comp that Dane Brugler threw out in the Beast for Xavier Worthy it was shades of Deshaun Jackson. Mm, I see it. Could use that in the 49ers offense, an infusion of speed in the 49ers offense. I could, I could, I mean, I think that's one of the dark horse picks for the 49ers is Xavier Worthy. Or they go another position in the first round. He's still there. They trade up in the second round. They always end up trading up for the Kyle receivers too, right? So maybe that's a, a second round trade up player. Who knows? I'm putting Mims next, Croc. All right. This is the point where it's worth it's still it. scary, though. It's still scary, but after the other tackles are gone, this is where it becomes worth it for me. So Marius Mims is going 31. The question becomes, A.D. Mitchell, Ladd McConkey, Roger Rosengarten, Jordan Morgan, who finished I, I, in the top 32 of the big board? Tyler Guyton, Zach Frazier? I, I think Mims is just a player that I probably would take off of my draft board. You take him off completely? Yes. Wow. Well, I, I just think the there's too many of these things where it's like, uh, I don't, you, you know, and it's like the talent for sure. But, man, you barely play. Couldn't stay on the field. How healthy are you going to be? I mean, four nine, they, they've drafted these guys where it's like, okay, we're going to bank on this guy all of a sudden being healthier than he was in college. How has that worked out? I Inexperience. I mean, he has like all the, the inexperience. Injury, injury history, 
heavier than you would ideally like. I mean, those are just those he are red moves, flags. That he moves well enough that I I'm not worried about his size. Some of these guys like Tyler Guyton, I, he he plays tall. He's too tall. He's upright. I, I, it it affects him. For Mims, I don't think his his size necessarily affects him. He he moves really well for how big he is, and his injury history is interesting because he just he played at Georgia, right? So there's first round picks in front of him. So he just he didn't get a chance to play early because of that, and he's coming out of the draft early. But he had one injury that derailed one season of as a starter. So it's not like he's got this long injury history. And but you just said he started eight games last year and only finished six of them. Now, oh, somebody no. in the chat said, oh, it worked for Frank Gore, who obviously we know he tore multiple ACLs. Yeah. Frank Gore is a third-round pick. Third-round pick. That's right. This is where I'm okay with it, with Mims, when the other tackles are off the board. And I'm going to take a swing on Mims, what he could be over Rosengarten, over Jordan Morgan. But I like that we have him down the list, and that would mean that this, this draft, the draft would have to go that these exact 30 players go in front of the 49ers to take Mims at 31. And one of the guys is going to go. One of the guys is in front of Mims is going to be there. So we're, we're, we're not going to draft Mims at 31 if he's listed at 31, most likely. Uh, to be honest with you, AD Mitchell scares me just as much. And if they both hit, then Mims is still more valuable, probably. Yeah. Well, maybe not. I mean, if AD Mitchell is like faster CD Lamb, that's pretty special. <laughs> If, the, if if you see things that you like and you want a team that's going to be able to get it out of them, you just have to ask yourself how he's going to handle the doghouse. And if he doesn't take well to coaching, maybe he's not going to handle the doghouse well. But if he was a guy where you met with him and you're like, oh, man, that you know, oh, no, this is a guy that's a dog, and he'll figure it out. I think at some point he will be in the doghouse for the 49ers. But if he can make it out, he'll be a much better receiver with his height, weight, speed, ability and you know you got Kyle pushing him to be the best version of himself now you're talking about a high end yeah. receiver and but if you don't but if, if they're saying he's not coachable then you'll never make it out yeah. of Kyle's doghouse. Yeah and, and he'll get that information. But if it's only just the diabetes thing because all the all the negatives like are kind of tied into the the symptoms of the diabetes. So if they get the diabetes figured out and as was pointed out in the chat Mark Andrews has like other players have had type one diabetes and, and been NFL players, if they get that figured out and he can just do what he needs to do and be compliant for his condition, right? And you got an all pro wide receiver. If it's just, if it's just that one thing, is that the uncoachable part or is it other stuff? And like, if you're, if you have a condition, you only take your medicine and get ready for practice. I mean, I think that says a lot. So yeah, for me, that's why he's, he's, he slides even more here. Um, do you put him here at 32? Do you put Lad McConkey at 32? Who's the next player for you? I, I would put Lad McConkey. I feel like if I if I draft Lad McConkey, he's gonna do everything he's supposed to do. And he still brings like he brings some good stuff. Like when you watch his film, you can't help but see how much he threatens corners with his speed. You can't help but see how you know he plays outside, he plays in the slot, how well he runs routes, how well he catches the ball. How much of a vertical threat he is getting on guys' toes really quick and blown by them. I mean, he just he does so much so well. I think even 32 might be low for how how good he is. In another offense that just features a more, you're talking about a more productive, maybe two times as much production. What uh what role does he play in the 49ers offense? Is he the Z receiver? And he kind of does the slot thing in year one. Like he's basically, he's Ray Ray McLeod as a rookie. Then the 49ers trade Debo Samuel after re-signing Brandon Ayuk. If that's the scenario we're going with, does Ayuk start playing more Z and you start scheming things up for him? And then McConkie's like the X guy on the outside or you leave D or you leave Ayuk doing what he's doing already. And then you let, McConkey do some of those things that Debo was doing play the Z. Obviously, he wouldn't be a wide back, but he would be playing the Z receiver role because, you know, it's Z, it's X, and it's F. Those are the three receiver spots for the 49ers. I think definitely Z. Definitely Z. Off and and you can move him around. You can do some slot on. stuff, but uh, definitely a Z. You, you don't want him being that X stationary on the ball. 
I mean, yeah. damn, I, I've been screaming for them to move around IU more. And Kyle's going to tell you, well, they need to know every position. Like, it that's what he would tell you. Right. But it's very clear that IU, more than anything else, lines up as an X receiver. So I, I think, you know, if you said, all right, McConkie, you're going to play off of that. What about He Moore? really reminds me of Brandon Cooks. Like, uh, everything about him looks like Brandon Cooks. I like that comp a lot. What about Xavier Worthy? Because he's like, you know, speedy wise, he could be an X outside guy, uh, but he's skinny. You don't want DBs getting their hands on him. You might want him off the line of scrimmage, moving him around and stuff. So, same question for him. Would, would he also be more of a, a Z type of a player? Or would, or would you want to make maybe have him play a little bit more X, Ayuk style, let Ayuk move into a role where they're manufacturing more touches for him? Yeah, I'd say both of them. Like, if I can help it, get the more mm-hmm. cleaner releases. Yeah, and that's not saying that they can't be press. Like, right? It, you know, Worthy has film beating press. Right, and they've both got top end speed and quicks. They just don't have. They're just not power players. Uh, King Zay says we're tripping. He says over AD Mitchell, but we explain the reason why to it. N- Mitchell, we can't right. trust him. There's too much. There's too much boomer bust there. Um, and maybe if you had the insight, and Sarkeesian's like, I oh, know he's a great kid. Just, just have someone give him his mess in the morning. He's fine. You know, that's all it is. Then maybe because you know he's a he, he's a freak. He's a beast. But you know, there's it goes back to multiple schools where people talking about he's being uncoachable, and so that's it's a pretty big red flag there. And that's just the insight. Like that's what we're being fed. So that's all we know. But again, if, if, these uh, anonymous scouts are are kind of tripping. It's a good word for it. They're tripping sometimes. There, there's some wild quotes out there from scouts. But it was it was numerous scouts from different teams that were talking about this stuff with with Ad Mitchell. And you yeah. see it on the field, right? Like not like I don't know if it's I don't know if diabetes is why he's running half speed routes. But his play is inconsistent. And you're like, what, what's going on here? What's this route? What's this? And then sometimes you're like, oh, there it is. Remember, we had to watch five games to see anything that, that was close to 4-3 speed. We're like, oh, there's that speed. And we had to actually, we had to go see. It was back from Georgia where I yeah. finally saw it. I was like, oh, there it is, right? I think we, we, we saw some of the speed, but I think to see the quickness go with it, and we had to go back to Georgia. Break where it's like, boom, you're like, okay, there it is. He looked bigger, like he he didn't weigh in as like this big guy, right? No, no, we're we're like he looks six four, but that's the thing is everyone's size is inflated, so you don't really know what you're looking at in college, and it just turns out everybody's an inch shorter. But yeah, he still was he still weighed in smaller than I thought at the combine, six two and a half, two oh five, and, and that's kind of like, I guess like CD Lamb, right? Like CD Lamb, I think he was like one ninety two, but when you're watching them at Oklahoma. He just looked bigger than 192. And he was listed at 6'3", and he came in at like 6'1 and a half, too. Yeah. All right, there's the top 32. That's the big board. It is now set. The official Locked On 49ers, even though this isn't Locked On 49ers. This is the Peacock big board, 1 through 32. Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Joe Alt, Romo Dunze, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy. That's the group of the, you know, they're going to be gone there. That's the top of the draft. That's the consensus top eight players there that, that should be taken uh, at some point in the eight or first eight or nine picks. Then we got Brock Bowers, Dallas Turner, Quinian Mitchell, Olu Fashionu, uh, Leo Tulatu, Terry and Arnold, Jared Verse, Brian Thomas Jr., uh, Byron Murphy, Talise Fuaga, Troy Faltanu, JC Latham, Nate Wiggins, Cooper DeJean, defensive back Cooper DeJean, not cornerback Cooper DeJean, Johnny Newton, Chop Robinson, Darius Robinson, Jackson Powers Johnson, Graham Barton, Kingsley Suomataia, Xavier Worthy, Shocker, Kool-Aid McKinstry, Amarius Mims, and Lad McConkie. That is the big board. Who's next, Croc, for you? We're talking second round now. Ideal world. 49ers draft one of these guys in round one. Who are your favorites here left that we've done deep dives on for round two? We got Jordan Morgan. We got A.D. Mitchell. We got... Roger Rosengarden still there. We got Xavier Leggett. We got Malachi Corley, Max Melton, Zach Frazier, Tyler Guyton, Patrick Paul, Mike Sanders still, uh, DJ James, Anis Rakestraw, Braden Fisk, Javon Baker, TJ Tampa, and Marshawn Neeland. Oh, I think, uh, you know, I'm looking at and scroll up just a little bit. 
Uh, but I'm looking at Max Milton, and I'm looking at uh, Rosengarten. And again, A.D. Mitchell, he should be in this range for sure. Like, we, we probably point, should have been talking about him, but again, we're talking about some of the red flags. So, right. uh, A.D. Mitchell is, is just a tough one, but I'm, you know, I'm with- higher on Rosengarten than you. You're, you're, lower, you're much lower on Rosengarten. I'm lower on Rosengarten. I'd be fine with him at, at 63. I just I just don't love him as much in the first round. I know you like him more, so so we'll, we can bump him up from where I currently have him. I like Jordan Morgan, too. I, I feel like he's just not what I'm looking for with a first-round pick. Um, and I don't think he's going to stick at tackle necessarily in the NFL either. I'm going to put A.D. Mitchell next on this little uh, our little sub list here just because he deserves to be up there. He's got the talent to be up there. We just don't know what to do with him, so he's kind of off our first-round board. Um, and I get why you would say Mims should be off our first round board too, but I snuck him in there. <laughs> I, I don't love Tyler Guyton for the 49ers. I had to go back to my, let's see my handy dandy notes on, on Guyton. Uh, Guyton. Yeah. Uh, Guyton, not as fleet footed, a little heavy mover. Not sure how he handles speed. Uh, doesn't see. Oh, don't see a good pass pro set. Uh, switch it. Oh, no, that was actually right there on the last part. But those are some of my initial notes on Tyler Guyton. Not uh, ideal for a potential 49er offensive lineman. <laughs> because basically what I'm saying, I, I hate the way he moves. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the thing is because he's 6'7", and he's a former tight end too. So you're like, oh, athlete, big athlete. That's how he's being built. But he didn't test that way versus some of these other bigger tackles, even that are six seven, and he kind of he does uh, he's upright. He lumbers sometimes, and sometimes you see it. And you're like, okay, he's an athlete. Um, I just didn't love it. Didn't love it for the way he moved. I, I don't know if he's a great fit for the 49ers. Um, so yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I'm lower on him than a lot of people have him. A lot of people would have him here in the top 32, and he, he's just not there for me. And I'm glad you saw it the same. Leggett and Corley. I'm trying to remember how you felt about Xavier Leggett. Let's see if I have the notes, but okay, here we go. Uh, Leggett. Uh, big mover. And again, that just means somebody who uh, doesn't look as light on his feet. All right. Uh, but more than a willing blocker, which Fortnite really like that. Terrific hands and body control. Now, one one tweet that just I keep seeing on my timeline about him is like catches the crossing route, just outruns everybody. Right. To the end of like looks like DK Metcalf a little bit. Yeah, he he opens up the stride. You're like, okay, he's he's fast. Yeah, but I felt like he was more of a body control possession guy more than oh man, I'm just gonna threaten you with all this speed consistently. Then he tested well, so he has the size. He tested well. So you see a lot of ability, and that's something that could be intriguing to the 49ers. Um, now, Corley, did you did you mention Corley as well just now? I mentioned Corley, yeah. We're trying to separate those two. It, D, uh, D, Debo Samuel. But now, and what I put in here, he is your current version of Debo Samuel as opposed to Debo Samuel the prospect. Because Debo Samuel the right. prospect, he was my – wide receiver 1B, like 1A, 1B, 1C, however you want to look at it. I love DK Metcalf, and it's just like, ah, freakish, 6'4", 230 ability with how fast he was, and it's just like that, the guys like him don't come around long enough. So by default, he was wide receiver 1. But then after that, I just really like Debo and A.J. Brown. Those are my next two receivers in that class. When I think of Corley, I don't view him like I view Debo Samuel. But – when you look at how Debo is utilized at the 49ers now, Corley does all those Debo Samuel things. So it's like if you're looking for a replacement based on what D, what the version of Debo you have now, I think he has a lot of that ability. But, again, that, that was not all Debo was coming out of college. Like He could run routes. He was quick. He was really light on his feet. Change of direction was there. He was threatening guys vertically. Like He did a lot of really good stuff. I and now like, he's turned in more of a wide back now. Like he's like a true wide back. Yeah. And 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 
Corley was basically a wide back in college. I liked that you could see him up against better competition, running routes at the senior bowl, and he looked pretty good doing it. So that's why I think there's more to him there. And it was more about the offense. And they just treated him like a former running back that he was. And he wasn't even allowed to do some of the things that he was at the senior bowl in college. Ah, I, I, think there's a little I, bit more there. I thought he, he, Debo, okay, again, go back to Debo Samuel, right? Because that's it. When you watch Debo Samuel go at it with Rock Nassin, yeah, it was, you know, he showed you more, like just light on his feet, double sticking releases, yeah. you know, going by like just you know, uh, quick on his feet at the line of scrimmage, turning Rock Nassin around on slants, like you just saw more. When I watched Corley in his reps at the Senior Bowl, it was a guy who was like, "Well, I'm just gonna run this route and then I'm gonna run straight into the DB." And just hope I can create separation by like just pushing, <laughs> pushing off. You using know? My, yeah, using his his power. Because I, you know, I I I have trouble just kind of you know threatening him with understanding leverage and things like that. So, so gadget player essentially is what you're talking about with Malachi Corley. And so Leggett clearly ahead of Corley. Uh, the way I have this listed now, these are uh, we've got some other questions here. Edrin Cooper, Ruka Roro. I've watched Ruka Roro. Croc hasn't. We haven't done a deep dive. So these are the players we've done the deep dives with on Lockdown 49ers. Um, and we've really, I think, touched on anybody that's going to be a first round pick for the Niners. We, we, we have a lot of players to watch and we're not gonna be able to watch everybody for day two and day three and all of that. Um, I wasn't that big on Ruka Roro, by the way, Edrin Cooper. I don't think the Niners can be drafting a second round linebacker. So uh, yeah. and he's probably going to go before the 49ers second round pick. I think he's probably gonna be the top linebacker in this draft. I'm not sure. So definitely not doing a deep dive on him. And, and we're, we're looking at 49ers picks here. So of the non of the players that didn't make our big board here, Croc, I've got these guys here listed into sort of second round and third round buckets. Do you agree with that? And do you like the order I have these guys in and on, in our second and third round areas? Yep, yep. I like that. And, uh, you know, TJ Tampa, a guy that a lot of people are higher on, right? Like, you know, Tebow, TJ Tampa is like, oh, he's first round pick. Would I be surprised based on how other people talk about him? No. Uh, based off of what I saw. It, TJ Tampa or DJ James for you? I like DJ James is more my kind of corner. And he reminded me more of like, uh, Emmanuel Mosley. What about? Yeah, Emmanuel. now Mosley was an undrafted guy, but just the way he moves, some versatility. You know, is he a guy that may go in the fourth, fifth round? Like, you know, may, maybe. But I, I still would like draft him over TJ Tampa. And uh, T, maybe I'm wrong with that, right? Like, maybe TJ Tampa is, um, uh, uh, Johnson, Jalen Johnson, right? Like, I, I, he's another guy. Like, I just wasn't like super high on Jalen Johnson when he was coming out. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh man, he might be the, you know, you know, you have digs, and but maybe the, you know, he's one of the better corners from that class. Did you Ennis Rakestraw, third, second round or third round? He was an interesting one because I have that I gave him that big mover tag, and then he turned out to be like one eighty, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you can't move like Eric Crocker and be one hundred and eighty two right. pounds. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we I think we've got it. Here's our uh our day two working list of the players we've done deep dives on. TJ Tampa and Marshawn Nealand are two players that I watched that uh, and some of these players were you know a little disappointing just in that you know they're being billed as a certain thing. And and we people have been talking about, and I know in the beast, Marshawn Nealand, the Niners brought in Nealand as a uh as a 30 visit, and people have been talking about him as a dark horse first rounder. Uh, both of us crock, we didn't see a first round player on tape for for Marshawn Nealand, right? Right. Yeah. Have you watched uh, Ricky Parasol, Slick Rick? Uh, I have a little bit. I don't have like a full report or anything on him, but I've watched him. And I, I talked about him being, I think, a, a Shanahan receiver that Shanahan might like. He's got ball skills. Um, he's, uh, I don't think he plays quite to the level of his workouts, but he worked out crazy too. Uh, I think he's definitely going to be a second round guy. Yeah. It's interesting seeing guys like that, like, and just the different ways that it can go, you know, just talking about playing to like a certain speed. I remember when Justin Jefferson was coming out and I was really high on Jefferson. Uh, matter of fact, I got killed. I did a mock draft on locked on 49ers and the 49ers had the 13th overall pick. 
and I traded back to pick 18 and drafted Justin Jefferson. I got killed. And if you look on my social media, I I, I mean, I tried to speak it into existence. I'm like, 49ers are going to trade back. They're going to draft Justin Jefferson. Like, Justin Jefferson, he's going to be a 49er. Now, I say all that, and as much as I liked him, loved him coming out, I didn't think uh, – and, again, you guys can see all these tweets too. Like, you can see, like, I'm like, Jay Jettis, he's going to be a 49er tomorrow. You know, by the time when we're going to sleep, like, Justin Jefferson going to be a 49er. Clearly he wasn't. And the guy, I hope he's really good. Um, but, again, this is going back to, like, just the testing. I thought he tested better than what he consistently showed on film in college, even though I was still high on him. And I don't get that from Slick Rick, uh, Ricky Pearsall. Like, I see Pearsall, and um, I just – I did. I'm like you. I didn't see him be as good as he tested, but there's certain guys you could see, like how his game translates to the to the league. And and I hate the com- comparing, you know, white guy on white guy. And, but like Adam Thielen, Adam Thielen ran a four four five coming out, and yeah, it was like, oh, it works. you know, if you told me I got Adam Thielen, you know. In the second round, and his name is Ricky Pearsall, and I don't think like, I'd be extremely happy with that. I got Frazier over Rosengarten. I think he's a better player at his position. I know Rosengarten. I'll, I'll give you that. I mean, I, th- I think you, you know, even having Rosengarten this high, that's probably higher than you ideally would like him. But, you know, yeah. I, I, I feel good. Because if you're telling me he's a 38th player on our big board, well, he, but you're I, picking I at 31. And you I draft them seven be, slots higher, like I, I wouldn't be mad at that. I wouldn't necessarily say that these are the next like five necessarily in order or anything like that, but just of the players we watched, I think these are the guys that'd be cool with in the second okay. round. I'd rather have these guys over here in the third round. But you know, if if we were watching more guys, we might have to move a few more players up in here, uh, in front of some of these guys that are in our, our second round bucket. Um, but I might swing Marshawn Nealand up one more above Corley. What do you think? Yeah. That's how I like it. It Keeps moving both these at the same time. All right, there we go. That's the second and third round, guys. Again, these are just some of the players we have watched so far. We still have a little bit of time to do some scouting reports, so let us know in the chat. Let us know on Twitter, at BD Peacock, at Eric underscore Crocker. uh, If there is a certain player that you want us to scout that you think is a, is a great fit for the San Francisco 49ers. And we will go through it Um, real quick on, on Marshawn Neeland, check out the latest locked on 49ers podcast. We did a deep dive on him. Um, He is my comp for him was the water boy. He just runs like a maniac straight into the blocker in front of him, tries to go through him Uh, is bull rush all day, every day. And that's it. Uh, and, And, Nice testing numbers. I didn't quite see the uh, the athletic ability on tape and the, especially the ability to turn and bend and get to the quarterback. Uh, he looked a little locked up, a little tight in the hips there versus what his uh, his testing numbers were. So I'm not quite buying the first-round hype on Marshawn Nealon. Second round, sure. Uh, first round, not so much with the, uh, the small school defensive end. So there we go. There's our big board, Croc. Appreciate the help, helping me uh, hammer out this – this 49ers big board. I like it, man. I like the work we did here. Yep. Somebody says Solomon Thomas. He says, so he's Solomon Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. They kind of have that build. Like, he's just a little taller, slimmer version of Solomon Thomas. It's tough, though. Like, those things are tough because, like, Solomon Thomas was unanimous, unanimously a, a top 10 pick. Uh, he was, like, 12, 13, something like that for me, I think, that year. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you dropped him that too, and it's just the wrong guy <laughs> or three. They traded back, but ooh, Tyrone Tracy. This is a really good one. I like day three for the 49ers. He is a former receiver turned running back. Uh, he's got some really good receiving skills. He's got some athleticism, and he was really good in his one year as a as a converted running back in college. He's an interesting right. name for me. I like him a lot. And it's good to him. Absolutely. And you sent me a name too. You sent me a text. Oh no, no, no. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Okay, that was Neely. Oh, yeah, that was Neyland. That was the last guy we did there. <laughs> Ricky Prohl. Yeah, Ricky Prohl. That, that used to be the white guy comp. Now we have a, a bigger group of now we got guys. Adam Thielen, Cooper Cup. Yeah, 
Cooper Cup, <laughs> um, all the all the the Patriots wide receivers. Uh, who's the Andy Isabella? I'm glad we see we didn't pull that one out. Andy Isabella with, with Lab McConkey, you know, just fast believe, little white guy. I can't believe people were drafting Andy Isabella over DK Metcalf because mm-hmm. they were the same player, except one of them six four and one of them's five eight. Andy Isabella didn't win in any extra ways that DK Metcalf didn't win, right? It's not like he used his short stature to be like a, a jitterbug and be awesome running routes and getting open. He was just like a, a downfield guy, downfield speed guy. It's like, why wouldn't you take the 6'4", 230 guy? <laughs> Unbelievable. Sometimes it's just it's so simple and it's staring you right in the face and you still screwed it up. Hopefully we did not with our big board. Thanks, everybody. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on the new channel. Uh, trying to get to that first thousand subscriber mark before the draft next week. And, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to hit it because I'm very close there already. So appreciate you guys. Appreciate all the support on the new channel. So pre- appreciate all the support with Croc and I on Locked On 49ers. And Croc, always great chatting with you. Thanks for staying up late and uh, and uh, getting this big board done. I'm getting pumped for the draft, Croc. I mean, maybe we'll make some minor additions to it. And if we do, we'll let you know on Locked On 49ers. And, yeah, we'll be back Monday, right? Locked on 49ers, Croc. We're done for the week. This is it. We are done for the week. We'll, we will be back Monday. And then probably Monday morning when we record because I'll be coming back late from Los Angeles. Yeah. So Ho- Monday, Hollywood, Monday. Hollywood was Beverly Hills. Oh, Beverly Hills. We got fancy Crocky this weekend. Look out for I know. Beverly Hills. <laughs> it, uh, don't, don't go to Beverly Hills, man. It is, you're like, am I living right? Like, am I... <laughs> Uh, and uh, I will be back, though, actually, to finish the week tomorrow night. I'm going to do a little cocktail, cocktail hour, talking more about the later prospects, maybe the third round, fourth round, day three, undrafted free agent prospects with Larry Kruger. Larry Kruger loves him, an undrafted free agent. So we'll be talking about those types of prospects tomorrow on OT with BP. Not even drafted! And make sure you subscribe. Talk to you then right here. Overtime with Brian Peacock. Hit that sub.